Madison held Ian tightly, refusing to let go as she bit down on her lip and cried. They only got a few seconds together, however, before a group of people rushed into the room wearing white coats. Leona stood at the back of the group, looking at them coldly. She was followed closely by Olivia. Get him out of here immediately, she told them, and they went to tear them away from each other. It was as if they were never to meet again. Madison held on to Ian with all of her might, ignoring the sharp pain running through her injured arm. He clung on to her just as ferociously. But even with their combined efforts, they couldn't resist the strength of a dozen professional caregivers fighting against them. In seconds, only their hands remained touching, and she called out for him through her emotional turmoil. He grabbed her palms in his, not afraid of hurting her anymore. The most important thing was that they didn't get separated. Daniel and Cassandra, who were watching them through the doorway, looked away, their eyes red. They had heard what Mr. Walton had said, and they knew that the only thing they could do for Ian was to get him to divorce Madison. If they didn't, it was possible that he wouldn't stay with them for long. Despite understanding the reasoning behind it, they still felt uncomfortable watching their struggle. You can't do this! No, you can't! Madison screamed. I don't want to leave! I don't want a divorce! Their eyes were fixed on one another. She didn't want to leave and didn't want to divorce him, but Olivia had said it was the only way to help him. In the end, the caregivers managed to separate them, and Ian was forcefully escorted out of the room. All decision-making had been handed over to Olivia, and there was nothing he could do. One of the nurses had accidentally pushed Madison onto the bed. When she managed to sit up, Ian had already disappeared, and soon no one else remained but her. The place became empty and bleak. She lay on the bed crying and depleted. When the door finally opened again, she only listened to the steps absent-mindedly, because she knew that the person coming to see her wasn't Ian. Zack had been driving when he received Daniel's call. Sam had been with him, but when he heard the sound of Madison's desperate cries over the phone, he had gotten so scared that he had almost crashed the car. They quickly turned the vehicle around and rushed over to see his sister. The moment he stepped into the bedroom, his eyes fell on the messy scene before him. Behind him, Sam covered her mouth in shock. Then they noticed Madison lying on the bed limply, showing almost no signs of life. It was the first time that she was seeing her in such a state. Madison was dressed in her pajamas and had bandages on various parts of her body. In some places, the wrappings were stained with blood that had soaked through. However, she didn't seem to be feeling any pain as she lay there like a rag doll. Madison, Zack uttered with trembling lips. He couldn't believe that the person in front of him was his sister. He reached out to carefully touch her and felt the bone-piercing chill coming from her body. He was so shocked by it that he jerked away before taking off his coat and covering her with it, carefully wrapping his arms around her. It's me, Zack. Sam gave him a sympathetic look. She didn't know what had happened to Madison, but from looking at the place, she could tell that it was serious. She stayed where she was quiet and didn't disturb the two. Madison smiled when she saw Zack. Zack? It's me, Madison. Don't be scared. It's all right. The state she was in scared him, and she looked like she had suffered something incredibly cruel. His mind went back to what had happened to her all those years ago, when she had been just ten years old. And for a brief moment he panicked, thinking that it had happened again. He hugged her close and rubbed her healthy arm comfortingly. It's okay. I'm here now, it's okay. Zack, she muttered into his ear senselessly. He stayed with her until he felt that she had warmed up a little. Slowly, she came back into the present and curled up in his arms, crying once more. Don't be afraid, it's okay now, I'm taking you home, he told her, holding her close. I'm taking you home, okay, come on. He wrapped her up tightly in his coat and picked her up, carrying her out of the room. She leaned against him without any resistance as she continued to cry. He walked forward with steady steps, a gloomy look on his face. When he saw the Westons, he threw them a dirty look and walked right past them. Sam followed behind, 
carefully observing the situation in the family with furrowed brows. The Westons were all huddled in the living room, except Edward, who had gone to work early that morning. Daniel frowned as they walked past. Tense with guilt, he couldn't even say anything. Cassandra covered her mouth when she saw Madison, not daring to make a sound. Olivia raised her head, and it looked like she wanted to say something, but decided not to when Zack looked away, pretending not to see her. She stood rooted to the spot, taken aback by his dismissal, while Zack felt cold rage running through him. In his eyes, the Westons didn't deserve his respect. He wasn't going to be polite to people who had hurt his sister. Once they were in the hallway, Madison raised her head a little to look at the familiar place. She searched around for Ian but couldn't spot him anywhere. As for the others, she didn't want to lay eyes on them. Zack paused at the front door and said in a loud, clear voice, Your family is prestigious. A good education and family integrity are put to great use by bullying a defenseless girl. I wonder how far you'd be willing to go. He walked through the door and out of the house without another word, and didn't stop until he reached his car, leaving the speechless Westons behind. Those idiots, he thought. He had known that being a part of the family wasn't an easy life, and had never wanted Madison to marry one of them. At first, he had trusted Ian to protect her. He had never thought the day would come when the Weston son would be so helpless. Sam drove them home while Zack gently comforted Madison in the back seat. None of them said anything. When they arrived at the Greenwald family home, Sam saw the worry in John's eyes as he waited by the door. She glanced at Madison, who was lying unconscious in Zack's arms, through the rearview mirror. Once Zack got Madison out of the car, he said goodbye to Sam, and she headed home. John came up to meet them, and his eyes landed on Madison. When he saw that she didn't react to him at all, he looked concerned. What happened to her? He asked angrily, noticing her injuries. Zack shook his head and carried her inside quickly, taking her up to her room. Under his insistence, the room had been kept just as it had been while she had still lived there. Even after Kate had joined the family, nothing had changed. John followed close behind them. He saw Madison lying on the bed, curled up and unconscious, and felt a pain in his heart. Perhaps familial love had gained value to him since he had lost his daughter and granddaughter. He had even forgiven Kate for all her mistakes, and he had also begun to treat his children better. It was like he was a completely different person. He reached out and gently touched Madison's foot, and she shrank back a little. He could feel fury building up inside him, along with a deep sadness for his adoptive daughter. That little bastard. Does he think he can hurt my daughter? He thought. When Stella saw what was going on, she quickly went to fetch a bowl of hot water and a medical kit. Zack took Madison into his arms and began treating her wounds carefully, while John watched from his side with his hands behind his back. Zack had limited experience treating such wounds, and Stella couldn't stand watching him do a mediocre job. She went up to the bed, took the kit from him, and began gently treating Madison herself. She had a look of concentration on her face as if she wasn't treating Madison, but rather her deceased daughter. Looking down at her stepdaughter, all she could see was Kelsey. She had watched her daughter get pushed around by her mother-in-law when she had been married to Luke, and it pained her to see Madison in the same position. They knew that it had been Madison who had run to Jason in her high heels when Kelsey had been dying, begging him to send out one of the family doctors to treat her. She hadn't just stood by and watched her suffer. With Kelsey gone, Kate and Madison were the only Greenwall daughters left, and they had suddenly become very precious to her and John. Madison woke up and blinked slowly at her. Stella gave her a soft smile as she continued treating her. You need to keep the wound from getting wet for a few days, okay? She told her stepdaughter, her tone unprecedentedly gentle. I'll make sure you eat all the right things in the next few days. We don't want this to leave too much of a scar. Madison looked at her blankly, tears welling up in her eyes. She had lost so much in her life, and it was like life was trying to give her something back for all she had suffered. After coming out of Madison's bedroom, John and Stella both looked at Zack, 
and they all went over into the living room. Kate wasn't home that day, and they were the only ones left in the house. As the staff rarely entered the living room, everything was exceptionally quiet. What happened? John asked as soon as he sat down, his face serious. Had Kelsey and Elvie not died, Zack might have been wary of their sudden concern for Madison. But the Greenwald family truly seemed to have changed. John and Stella spent a lot of time patiently showing Kate the way of their family. And although she was hard to get through to, her unorthodox ways were now a thing of the past. Zack felt much more comfortable living in the family home again. To him, that was what home should feel like. It was a tragedy that they had only reached such a state after Kelsey's and Elvie's deaths. I don't know, Zack said, shaking his head. She was already like this when I went to get her. None of the Westons tried to get her to stay. They didn't even say a word when I took her. John slammed his palm against the coffee table and raged. He stood up and looked at the top of the stairs in the direction of Madison's room. What does that wretched family mean by this? Their son married a good daughter of our family and this is how they treat her? Why did she come back to us in this state? Who do they think they're dealing with? Stella didn't say anything, but felt a pang in her chest at the mention of Madison's wounds. It brought back terrifying memories from all those years before. Zack didn't know what to say either, and remained silent in the face of John's fury. His mind was spinning rapidly as he tried to figure out what could have happened to his little sister. Their thoughts were interrupted by the sound of footsteps on the stairs. They looked over and saw Madison wearing a simple coat and slippers. She ran right past them and out of the house as if she couldn't see any of them, her face full of anxiety and confusion. Madison! All three of them called out after her at once. They exchanged worried looks, and John and Zack sprang up from the couch and tried to stop her, but she was running down the street at speed, her determination pushing her to her very limit. John watched her vigilantly, afraid that she would get hit by a car. In the end, she managed to hail a cab and jump inside before they could catch up with her. Zack sighed angrily as he watched the taxi leave. Go get the car, John said, coming to a halt beside him. Zack turned at once and ran back to the house, while John waited for him to drive over. As soon as they were both seated, he shot forward like an arrow. Stella stood in the doorway with a pounding heart as she watched them leave. At the entrance to the A1 Logistics building, Madison ran out of the cab as soon as it stopped. The driver got out after her, shouting, Miss, you haven't paid yet. She continued, oblivious to anything other than getting inside. However, the building guards came forward to block her way, and the driver closed the car door and went up to meet her. Miss, you can't go in, one of the guards told her politely, looking her up and down. They had never experienced someone as raggedly as her trying to get into the building, and there was simply no way they were letting her in. Let me through. I need to go inside. Can you hear me? I need to go inside. She insisted, trying to push the guards out of her way. Jason was somewhere up there, and she needed him to tell her why he was forcing her to such an extent. If she begged him, maybe he would let her stay with Ian. Let me in right now. I want to see Jason right now. As soon as she mentioned the right's heir's name, the two guards looked down at her seriously. They were now even more determined to not let her in, and their handling of her became rougher than before. Miss, you really can't go in. Mr. Wright won't see you, one of them told her firmly. Let go of me! She struggled against them with all her might, but it was useless. Drawing back, she pinched her wrist in frustration. I want to see Jason. You must have come straight from the mental hospital, the driver said snarkily. You think the right family heir will see you like this? If I'd known you were crazy, I would have never picked you up. What did you say? An angry voice roared from behind them. Zack's car had stopped by the taxi, and the Greenwald men had gotten out in time to hear the driver's mocking words. John's face was red with anger, and he strode over to them with forceful steps. Who are you calling crazy? He turned to the two guards, who recognized him due to the collaboration between the two families. When they realized it was him, they grew unsure of their position. 
And you two. How dare you treat my daughter like this? The guard stared at him in surprise and quickly let go of Madison's hand. They couldn't believe she was a Greenwald. Everyone at the company knew that Jason had feelings for John Greenwald's daughter. And although he had two, it probably wasn't a good idea to offend either of them. Taking advantage of John's interruption, Madison sped past the guards and through the building entrance. John gave them a threatening look and chased after her, while Zack paid for the taxi and followed closely behind. The guards stayed at the entrance, looking confused. When the receptionist in the lobby saw Madison rushing through, she stood up to try and stop her. As soon as she saw her face, however, she halted, even reaching out to stop her colleague from interfering. What's wrong? he asked. They could throw us out for letting her through. They'll throw you out if you try to stop her, she replied. That's Madison Greenwald. Right then, Zack and John ran through the lobby, and she picked up her phone to make a call. If she didn't inform Jason that the Greenwalds were going up to see him, she'd be in great trouble. The elevator doors opened, and Madison slipped inside, frantically pushing the button to Jason's floor. She managed to evade her brother and father. The two men could only watch the doors close before them and wait for the next elevator to arrive. At that moment, Jason's assistant had already received a word of their presence in the building, and the situation was becoming increasingly chaotic. People were running around, preparing the place for Madison's visit. Did you inform Mr. Wright? Is the juice ready? Where's the fruit? The snacks? What about the magazines? Get a move on, we don't want to make her angry. The assistant waited by the door to the conference room while the staff prepared everything from coffee to snacks, wondering if she should go inside and interrupt Jason's high-level meeting to let him know about what was happening. Making up her mind, she knocked on the door and entered. Walking over to her boss's side, she leaned in and whispered, Mr. Wright, Miss Madison Greenwald is here. He stood up from his seat abruptly with undisguised joy. Meeting adjourned, he said before leaving the room, catching them all unprepared. Once outside, he let out a great sigh of relief, looking like a missing part of him had been restored. Madison stood in the corner of the elevator with a group of people before her, but it was like she couldn't see their curious glances. She knew Jason's floor from before, and her mind was set on a singular goal. The others in the elevator also knew where Jason worked, and they were interested to find out who was going to see him. Not everyone was allowed onto that level, after all. The elevator stopped, and Madison went up to the doors. Jason stood on the other side, and their eyes met. She looked at him, but didn't say anything, while all the others greeted him respectfully. He looked at them absent-mindedly his eyes full of excitement and joy. They were shocked by the strange display and had no idea what was going on. Jason stared straight at Madison as if nothing else mattered to him. Madison, he said. The people around her all turned in her direction, shocked to see that she was Madison Greenwald. None of them had expected Jason's dream girl to look like that. Some of them even thought about stepping in front of her so as not to upset him with her unruly appearance. What happened to you? He asked her, his initial joy dissipating at once. He looked over her pajamas and slippers and noticed the bandages. Madison, he said again, reaching out to touch her with a heartbroken look in his eyes. Before he could lay his fingers on her, however, she jerked away from him. You said that you'll only give me what I want if I leave Ian and marry you right? She asked, looking him directly in the eyes. As soon as the words left her mouth, the entire space became silent. The people lowered their heads at the mention of Jason's domineering ways. Even with her confrontation, he didn't seem like he was going to give up. Not all of them had known that he was in love with the married woman, and they listened to the scene with interest. He looked at her seriously, not wanting to speak in front of his employees. However, he knew that if he remained silent, it would answer their questions just as well as if he spoke. With a sad smile, Madison looked over her shoulder before stepping into the hallway. She looked confident and at ease, and she laughed a little. It was like the floor was her theater. All eyes were on her as if she were some sort of madman. 
She walked down the hallway with Jason following behind her, worried she would collapse at any second. Studying the place, she continued laughing all the way. The elevator with Zack and John finally arrived, and they tried to catch up with them. As they entered one of the rooms, her eyes fell on the refreshments that had been prepared for her. It was the perfect place for her to vent her anger. She reached out to take a piece of fruit and asked, Can I have some juice, milk, and coffee? As she spoke, she picked up a glass of milk and slowly poured its contents onto the ground. The staff frowned at her arrogance and looked over to see Jason's reaction. They all knew how much he hated wet floors. Sure enough, his eye twitched as he watched her deliberately dirty his office. One by one, she picked up all the drinks on the table and poured them onto the ground with a deep sadness in her eyes. As the last drop of liquid fell, she smiled. What is it? Do you not like what I'm doing? She asked. It was like time and space had frozen around them ever since she had arrived. Jason's hand clenched into a tight fist. I never even thought of hurting you. I can't back down on this because... <laughs> Madison laughed coldly, tears sliding down her face. She leaned against the desk, steadying herself as her body went weak. Why? Because you love me? She asked. He tensed up, but didn't try to dodge the question. Yes, because I love you. His words rang through the office loud and clear. He approached her slowly, step by step. I love you, Madison. I've never tried to keep that a secret. Still, I was a coward. If I had been braver, you would have been with me today. You would have been happy. Smiling brightly, she watched him draw closer. No matter how beautiful her smile was, they could all see the bone-piercing coldness behind it. It was as if she had been injured beyond repair. Now, standing before her, he took a deep breath and reached out to touch her again. Think about how we used to be in school. You know what kind of person I am. Think about it. Who can you rely on? He grabbed her hand and held it gently, careful not to hurt her. A spark of joy returned to his eyes at the contact, but she only lowered her gaze away from him. The simple action made him nervous, and he stayed very still for a long time until his assistant came up to him. Mr. Wright, perhaps you should speak with Miss Greenwald inside your office? She asked. Nodding, he wrapped his arm around her shoulders and began leading her in the direction of his office. It wasn't good to talk about such things with people watching. Lost in thought, Madison took a few steps forward as if she wasn't quite in touch with what was happening, and the people around slowly began returning to their work. Before the door, she suddenly stopped in her tracks. Madison? He asked her, worried. The door was right there in front of her, and she knew that everything would change if she let him lead her through it. Unwilling to step into that reality, she stayed rooted to the spot. She reached out and pushed him away before stumbling backward and falling against a wall. You won't let this rest until you've gotten what you want, right? She asked. No, he said with a frown. I'm not backing down on what I said. I want you to get a divorce. The wall was cool against her back, and she took deep breaths as she listened to him. I'm doing this for your good, he insisted. You'll only be happy if you leave him. You'll never lead a good life with him as your husband. Just trust me, okay? Disgusted, she turned around and walked away, not even wanting to look at him. Tears streamed down her face, knowing that there were some things Ian wouldn't have wanted her to say. It seemed that she would always be facing the cruelest hardships when it came to love. He took a deep breath, watching her walk away. With a step forward, he caught her wrist and pulled her back toward him until her ear was next to his lips. If you divorce him, I promise I'll immediately give the Westons what they want, he whispered. I can even use all of my family's resources and connections to help him, all right? I'm begging you, divorce him. He wrapped his arms around her and hugged her tightly, but she couldn't even feel his touch. She just stood there, crying numbly as she recalled the warmth of Ian's embrace, his face, and his comforting smell earlier that day. She wondered why she had lost all that in the span of just a few hours. Why do they think I can't be happy with him just because he's ill? 
How can they know what makes me happy? She thought miserably. Everyone watched him hug her while she cried. No one dared even breathe too loudly. Madison! Madison! He kept whispering into her ear, his grip on her tightening. Divorce him, please! He can't make you happy! He'll only become more and more dangerous if you stay with him. Just divorce him, please, and try to accept me! He could somehow stand her not loving him, but not her staying with Ian. If she divorced him, he would give him all the doctors he needed. While they stood there, the assistant began asking the staff to leave until only a few familiar people were left. Madison smiled through her tears. After hearing their conversation, Zack and John understood why. They didn't want her to be in danger either, and Zack decided to persuade her to do as Jason asked. She was quicker, however, and her words stunned them all into silence. Breaking free from Jason's grasp, she faced him and said, it's me you've wanted since the beginning, isn't that right? I'll be yours, Jason. I'll divorce Ian. But just promise me you'll leave me alone when you get bored. None of the men had ever seen her throw away her dignity like that, and they stared at her with wide eyes speechless. Jason's face paled. Yes, it was her that he'd wanted from the beginning, but not like that. She stared at him with clear eyes. They'd been friends for many years, and she'd known about his feelings for her for a long time. While he had genuinely cared for her happiness at the beginning, he had gone astray along the way. He had dreamed of being with her for so long, and had been willing to do anything to achieve it. Madison had realized his immediate motives when he refused to treat Ian right away, and had instead chosen to negotiate with the Westons. Do you want my body? Huh? I'll give it to you. It's yours. I'll give you my body, and you give me what I want. Her face was streaming with tears, but their eyes remained locked. She then did the most audacious thing that she'd ever done in her life. First, she let her coat slide to the ground, and she continued by unbuttoning the top of her pajamas. One button. Two button. Her actions shocked him, and he couldn't tell what she meant by them. He could only stare at her with wide eyes at a loss for what to do. John was also taken by surprise. Zack was the first to react, rushing in to stop her from undoing any more buttons by taking off his coat and wrapping it around her. He turned to glare at Jason hatefully. No matter what his initial thoughts had been about his motives, he couldn't forgive him for doing this to Madison. She cried so hard she couldn't breathe and tried to push her brother away, looking at Jason with hazy eyes. Let me go, Zack. Let me go. I don't want to be tied up like this for the rest of my life. He can have my body if he wants it. It's just a body. He hugged her close to him, his heart aching as he watched her struggle. Let go, she repeated, with no strength left in her. Please just let me go. I don't want anyone using me to restrain someone else. I want to be free of this. Neither Zack nor John could bear parting with her and John was unwilling to see the headstrong and resilient Madison degrade herself like that. He pushed down the pain in his heart and took her face in his hand, slapping her cheek with the other to bring her into the present. Jason leaped forward, afraid that John would hurt her. Are you okay? He asked her worriedly. Dad, Zack said angrily, but John didn't pay either of them any attention. Get yourself together and remember who you are, he said looking directly at his daughter. Don't forget that your name is still Weston. You haven't divorced yet. It was the first time he was scolding her with actual interest in her well-being. Even that small show of fatherly love was like a beacon of hope for her at that moment. You're not a girl anymore, Madison. You're a mother. Think of Sophia. How can you just give up so easily? Have you thought of how this will affect her in the future? How can you be so irresponsible? He roared at her. Think about what's ahead of you. You've already come this far. There's always some kind of solution. Think. She stared at him dumbfounded before throwing herself into his arms. Dad, she said through pain sobbing, hugging him close. It had been years since she had called him that. Even though they weren't related by blood, 
And even though they had never had a particularly good relationship, he was beginning to see her as his daughter. He felt his eyes prickling. There had been a period during her childhood when he had liked her, when he had happily held her and played with her. However, once his sons and daughters had entered the family, a distance gradually formed between the two of them. Zack watched them with moist eyes, and he stopped Jason as he tried to get close to Madison. Don't go near her, he told him. Otherwise, my sister may lose control again. Sorry for the trouble. With that, he turned around to comfort his father, and together they led Madison over to the elevator. They left without looking back, leaving Jason standing in the hallway with just his assistant, looking lonely and miserable. Before the elevator doors could close behind the Greenwald, Jason ran over, John pretending not to see him. But Jason managed to plunge his hand between the doors, activating the sensor and opening them once more. Zack narrowed his eyes dangerously at the man, and Madison didn't even turn to look at him. Jason gripped Madison and turned her around, and for the first time in ages, she saw pure love in his eyes. Take good care of yourself, he told her. However, the conditions he had set remained. He stepped back, and the doors closed. With almost no strength left in him, he walked back to his office and took off his tie and defeat. He threw it on the ground and stomped on it angrily. Madison, if I let all of this go, will you ever even want to see me again? He shouted out in his mind. He began thinking of the possible future. If she divorced and Ian was healed one day due to his help, perhaps she would come to love him and stay by his side instead. His mind raced caught in a whirlpool of obsession. When Stella saw Madison state upon arriving back at the Greenwald house, she quickly called for the staff to change her bandages and put her to bed while she went to make her some soup. Meanwhile, Zack and John retreated to the study. Madison slept for what seemed like a century and woke up hurting all over. The sky outside had already turned black, and she lay motionless on the bed, looking at the familiar bedsheets. Everything inside the room reminded her of the past, and she buried her face into her pillow as she cried once again. Her body twitched in pain as she thought of her husband. Ian, will I ever get to see you again? She thought. There came a knock on the door, and Stella came in carrying a tray of food. Your brother asked his friend to pack up things at the Weston house. Zack will go with you to get them tomorrow. How about some soup now? Comforted by Stella's kind and caring words, she got up, and thought about seeing the Westons the next day. As she slowly ate, Stella reminded her to mind her wounds over the next few days. Stella left soon after, and Madison's eyes fell on a bag that she had brought in with her. Inside was a divorce agreement. She hadn't expected to have to take it out so soon, and she put the bag away. She had asked Zack to take her to the Westons the next day, but when she went to the door to find him, she saw John and Stella running into each other in the hallway. How is she? John asked. She ate something, but not much, Stella replied. Both of them sounded very concerned about her. The Westons have forbidden her from coming close. No one's even allowed to mention her name in the house. Should we tell her? The words hit Madison like a bucket of cold water. Stella was talking softly and sounded very concerned for her eldest daughter. I'm afraid that if she goes over to the Weston's house, they won't let her in, and she'll take it badly. Madison could hear her mother and was distressed by what she was saying. The Westons are going to cut me off completely, she thought as she leaned against the wall for support. Don't talk to her about it for the time being because she's already quite upset, John said sounding very tired. He had aged a lot during the time he had been in prison, and also faced the death of his granddaughter, which further weakened him. But he had gained a lot of wisdom through his experiences. I'll make more of an effort with her, he continued. What she's going through isn't easy for her. When Madison heard her father say that, she almost burst into tears, and she quietly closed the door and sat down. When she was sure that no one could hear her, she began to sob. The sobbing wasn't for herself, but for Ian. She was worried about him, 
and was concerned that he was finding it difficult to cope without her. Madison knew that the Westons were trying their best to cast her out of the family and forget about her, but she believed that they couldn't eliminate her because of Ian. They want to airbrush me out of their family history, but Ian won't let them do that, she thought. She didn't care if the other Westons forgot about her, as long as Ian remembered her. Furthermore, she knew that no matter how unwilling they were to get involved with her, they would still come looking for her because the divorce papers needed her signature. That night was one of the few that Madison hadn't slept peacefully in Ian's arms since she had returned after her five-year absence. She was so unaccustomed to it that she was haunted by nightmares all night long. The next day, Madison woke up very early. As soon as she had washed and dressed, she went downstairs to prepare breakfast. No matter what she had heard that previous night, she still wanted to go to the Weston's house and find out for herself whether she would be allowed in. She planned to get Zach to take her there. When breakfast was ready, the whole of the Greenwald family gathered at the table to eat. Kate had returned late the previous evening, and Madison had already fallen asleep by the time she had arrived, so the two of them hadn't spoken to each other. Relations between Kate and Madison had been strained for a long time, which meant that the atmosphere at the table was tense. Kate refrained from being unpleasant to her sister because John was there, and she ate in silence. Madison didn't care about Kate's attitude. She was far more concerned about her problems with the Westons, so she ignored Kate and spoke to Zach. I'll go with you to the Westons' house later. There are some things that I want to bring back, she said. Zach stopped eating for a moment and tried to sound casual as he replied to her. If there's something you need to get, I'll pick it up for you. You should stay here until your feet are healed and let mom look after you. You didn't need to make breakfast this morning. Mom could have done it. That's right, Stella said as she poured another cup of coffee for Madison. Those wounds on your feet are nasty. If you're not careful, you could end up with permanent damage. You should stay here and recuperate for a few days. If you need anything from the Weston's place, let Zach go and get it for you. If he can't get it, you can buy it again. Madison insisted on going because she was determined to see whether she would be given access to Ian. Thanks, Mom, but I still want to go there myself. There are some things that Zach might not be able to find. I'll go up and change my clothes before we go. Wait for me, Zach. After saying that, she didn't give anyone a chance to speak before she went upstairs. Although she could only walk slowly, she was still capable of getting around. She suspected that Zack and Stella had been making a fuss about her injury because they didn't want her to visit the Westons. After Madison left the room, Zack and John frowned while Stella gave them an anxious look. After Kelsey had died, Stella had begun to love Madison more than Kate because she felt that Madison cared far more about Kelsey than Kate ever had. As well as that, she didn't like the way that Kate was only interested in money. What should we do? She'll be distraught if she's turned away from there, Stella said nervously. John didn't have any ideas about what to do, and he shook his head. Zach, however, had some suggestions. Why don't I just leave without her? Or else I could say that I have something to do today so I can't go. Kate stood up, looked at her brother, and smiled. I can tell you for sure that she's determined to go there. If you leave without her, she'll just call a taxi and follow you over there. And if you say that you have something to do, she'll go there without you. You need to go with her because it'll be worse for her to face it on her own. Since when did you care about her feelings? Zack asked. I don't. She can walk over there on her bandaged feet for all I care. I'm just stating the obvious, Kate replied. The others couldn't disagree with Kate's assessment of Madison's likely behavior. They all knew that she was very stubborn. Kate left the dining room and bumped into Madison in the upstairs corridor. She blocked Madison's way so that she could speak to her. It's been a long time since we last met, she said. Kate was standing very close to Madison and looked closely at her face. I can see that living with such a rich family has done you good. Your skin is in very good condition. I suppose you can afford to buy the most expensive skincare products and spend days at the spa. She looked and sounded resentful that Madison had improved her status. Unfortunately, it looks like those days are over for you, she continued. 
the Westons don't want you anymore. Yet you still want to go back. It's so sad. Poor Madison, she said in a mocking tone. As she spoke, she reached for a wisp of hair that was lying beside Madison's ear. There's something about you that I don't understand. Why are there so many men who like you? You always seem to get a lot more male attention than I do. After saying that, she yanked Madison's hair. It was so painful that Madison's face turned pale, and she grabbed Kate's hand, trying to force her to let go. Kate looked at her jealously. You need to remember that this isn't your home, she said. You turned your back on us before, so why are you even here? Even if the Westons turn you away, don't come back. You don't have any right to stay here. She let go of Madison's hair, and Madison looked at her without showing any emotion. Kate was slightly surprised that she wasn't either angry or scared. You'd better leave here soon, otherwise I'll be less friendly the next time we meet, Kate threatened. Then she hit Madison with her shoulder as she walked past her. Kate felt threatened by Madison's presence in the house. After Kelsey had died, Kate's position in the family had become stronger. While Madison had been with Ian, she had effectively been the only daughter in the family and she wasn't prepared to let Madison take her status away. When Madison went back downstairs, she stopped thinking about Kate's warning. At that moment, all she cared about was Ian. Come on, Zach, let's go, she said as soon as she walked into the dining room. Zach was still sitting at the table and swallowed hard when Madison spoke to him. He tried to think of a way out, but there was nothing he could do. Before he could stand up, the doorbell rang. John opened the door and invited in a man who was wearing a suit and carrying a briefcase. When she saw him, Madison immediately recognized him. It was Leo dashing. On seeing Madison, Leo appeared to be relieved. Hello, Mrs. Weston, he said. I'm glad I've managed to catch up with you. Madison realized that her hope of going to the Weston's place that morning had disappeared. The Greenwalds were pleased that her plan had been thwarted but they were concerned that Leo might be bringing bad news. They knew that Leo was the Weston family's lawyer, as well as Ian's lawyer. They all looked at him with trepidation, and no one spoke. Kate walked into the hallway and recognized the lawyer. She didn't want to get involved in whatever he was there to do, so she left immediately. After Kate left, Leo looked at the others but didn't speak. John eventually ended the awkward silence. Mr. Dashing... Please follow me to the study so that you can speak privately, he said. Leo smiled and nodded politely before following John to the study, but Madison didn't move. Instead, she spoke to Zach. Let's get out of here. I don't want to speak to Leo, she said. She didn't want to speak to him because she suspected that he was there to talk about her divorce. Leo overheard her and he turned around. Mrs. Weston, Mr. Weston asked me to see you. He made his request a month ago. Madison's body stiffened. If Ian instructed him a month ago, what does that mean? She wondered.